Is that a yay or a nay? All right. Okay. I got a couple of yays. All right. Perfect. So here is, here's our class, this Canvas page. Now this is instructor view. This is what I see when I go in. I'll click open student view just for a second here. So this is more what you see when you, um, when you join Canvas. So you can see that I have the getting started. I have the link to the textbook. Now I'm not going to click on that link to the textbook because I'm not a student, so it doesn't work for me, but I will show you in instructor mode in a few seconds. But you can see that I have modules set up for every chapter in Chemistry 3111. So you can see that I have the lecture notes and PowerPoint form. I used to try to just post them in PDF because I was paranoid about students taking my slides and posting them on the internet. But finally, I just gave up. So they're there in PowerPoint. If you want to edit them, send them to a loved one, convert them to PDF, whatever you want to do, do it. But I just ask that you don't disseminate them across the internet or Instagram or whatever, you know, hashtag chemistry, you know, anyhow. So you can see that I have all of the, um, all of the lecture notes already posted. And also I have suggested problems from each chapter. The suggested problems are not for points. These are just problems that I suggest, okay? So you can see here, that from chapter 11, I suggest that you do questions 11, 12, 13, so on. That's the end of the chapter, the in-chapter problems. And students usually like to do all of those because the best way to master organic chemistry is simply to practice it. So after that, you'll see that I have the links for all of the online homework. So if you want to do homework 11, you would simply click on the link. And um, yeah, the issues that we were having there, it seems like they're all worked out. Now you can see again, that we have a link for um, online quizzes and that the quiz uh, 11 is has a little bit different sign on the left hand side there and that's because it's going to be written through Wiley. Again, this quiz is only going to be open for 75 minutes on Friday. You don't need a webcam. You don't need a microphone. It, you don't need respondents, but you can see that for quizzes 12, 13, and 16 and the, and the following quizzes, we will be using respondents for those. Also, you can see that I posted a link to um, lecture videos. So yeah, you have a link to lecture videos. Okay. Um, sorry, just let me double check something here. Yep. There we go. All right. Um, yeah. So let me show you, I'm going to leave student view just for a second here because I'm not a student and I can't access the textbook. It's kind of strange, but so here's what I see when I log into Canvas, right? Ooh, look at all this crazy stuff that I see. Well, anyhow, if you click on Wiley Plus Read, Study, and Practice, okay? When you go in here, you have a new link, and we're going to pop that open. Okay, and then you're basically going to be opened to the textbook. Now, there are all kinds of resources in here, Orion and all the videos and things. These are all things that are put in place by Dr. Klein, who is the author of the textbook. I don't really use those a whole lot. Those are up to you if you want to use those. And some students find them interesting. But where this guy goes to is I always click on the downloadable e-textbook. That's directly where I go. So I open up the downloadable e-textbook. Just the way I like to do things. Oops. Uh, I guess. Oops. Come on. There we go. All right. So here we are in Chapter 11. And let's say you wanted to try Question 11.1, .1, which goes overall the reactions that we learn in chapter eight are virtually all of those, okay? So you would click, if you wanted to see the solutions to those, you would click on the number 11.1, .1, which is highlighted in blue. Let me do that, okay? And it will open up the most beautiful solutions manual you've ever seen in your life, okay? So you can see all of the answers and all of the answers or solutions really, not just the answers to all of the questions are in here. Now, if you've taken this class or Organic One with David Klein, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but if this book is new to you, you can see that you have total access to all of the solutions, which are exceedingly well done. All right, and it's also nice to be able to just, you know, kind of peruse the book like this. I, I mean, you can use it the other way, which is, um, I'll show you here. So you can open up the individual sections like this. So you can go to chapter one, scroll down chapter two, 11. If you want to read the book that way, I mean, that's up to you. Again, if you want to use the tools that are at the top here, that's up to you as well. I don't use them a whole heck of a lot. But uh, yeah, there's our textbook. So there you have it, folks. So we'll go back to home like that. And now let's get into the meat and potatoes. But before we do that, let me go back here. Um, no, I'll go over here.
And I'll just ask you, um, so somebody just typed in, do we have the answers to the suggested problems? Yes, those are the answers in the solutions manual. That's what I just showed you. All right. So um, before we get going and get into some real exciting chemistry here and try some fun synthesis problems, I just want to open it up to you guys. Does anybody have any other questions before we get Rick roll or rocking and rolling here? Not Rick rolling. That's something else. But anyhow, does anybody have any questions? Is everybody enjoying school in the time of COVID? Love it. Okay, great. I'll take that. Thank you, Andrea. Good. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. So one person is enjoying it. Anyhow, well, let's get some, somebody else says sometimes. No, I am not. Sorry, Luke. Luke, I, okay. Joe says no. Okay. Well, trying to, we'll get, well, let's try to make the best of the situation. Look, you know, stepping into this semester, what's my goal? My goal is to give you the best education that I can, you know, and then um, just try to try to teach you guys the best way that I can, you know, using the tools that we have. And I want you all to be successful in this class. You know, that's that's my goal. All right. OK, half of the instructors have a good method. And other half can't figure out effective remote delivery. Anyhow, I hope my method is okay. Um, anyhow, let's get going here. Let's try question 11.5. And I'm going to try to interact with you guys a little bit. If you want to type in some answers along the way, that would be cool to, you know, kind of help me out if I get stuck on a problem here. But let's start with question 11.5. This would be a perfectly legitimate question for your quiz that's coming up on Friday. It says identify reagents that can be used to achieve each of the following transformations. So let's start with A. And you guys probably recognize this molecule here. This is acetylene, acetylene, okay? And the that's the common name of this molecule. The IUPAC name is ethyne, but normally we call it acetylene because common names have that moniker for a reason, they're common. Anyway, you can see that Acetylene has two carbons in the molecule. And if you look at the product, we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So we have five carbons. Now, the good news is at this point in your career in organic chemistry, you only know one way really to, um, to enlarge a carbon skeleton. And that is to deprotonate acetylene, okay? And then to convert that into a good nucleophile, an acetylide ion. Okay, and after you do that, you can react it with an electrophile. And you might be wondering, well, what electrophiles would I use? And you can see that on the left-hand side, if you will, there's a methyl group. And on the right-hand side, you have, on the right-hand side, you have an ethyl group, right? CH2, CH3. And I'm going to start over here, and I'm going to try to walk you through the whole thing. I'm going to go a little bit slow at the beginning. But what we would start by doing is taking the acetylene, and the first thing we would do is we would treat that with sodium amide because sodium amide is a strong enough base to deprotonate um, the terminal protons of acetylene. So we could draw a curved arrow for that. It doesn't ask us to do that, but I'm going to do it just for fun. And then what you would end up with is this. You would end up with this anion here. This is called acetyl acetylide. Okay, acetylide, and acetylide is a great nucleophile. So if you take that acetylide and you treat it with something like methyl iodide, CH3I, okay, it's going to act as a nucleophile, and CH3I is an excellent electrophile, and you're going to end up with this molecule. And I'm going to put the methyl group on this side. So now we've already added the methyl group. That's done. Okay, check a room. Finished. Okay, so could anybody help me out? What would I do? To add the ethyl group, what should my next step be? Who could help me out? Absolutely. So Sean says yes, and Andrew says the same thing. Perfect. I know there might be a bit of a lag, so sometimes I'll kind of wait a few seconds to see if anybody has an answer, but both. Both of these gentlemen are correct. And that first, you would treat it with sodium amide. Sodium amide. 
and you're going to do the exact same thing again. So I'm going to draw it out in all the gory detail here. So we're going to deprotonate, okay? And then we're going to end up with this molecule. So I'll draw, I'm going to reverse it like this just to help me draw my curved arrows. And then Sean said to use ethyl iodide as an electrophile. So let's do that. So we'll put ethyl iodide. Let's draw our curved arrows. I don't know why I'm using different colors for the curved arrows, but whatever. Anyhow, so we do another S. This is just an SN2 reaction, right? Simple old SN2 reaction. And we finally end up with this molecule. So one, two, three, four, five. So there you have it, folks. That is the answer to that problem. I'm going to move this guy over here to be a little bit more tidy. But if you if you were doing this at home and practic practicing this on scratch paper, and if you simply wrote, if you simply wrote sodium amide in the first step, methyl iodide in the second step, sodium amide again, sodium amide in the third step, and then ethyl iodide in the fourth step like that, that's, that's exactly correct, okay? I just chose to show you all of the details here because it was kind of, getting back into the swing of things here. I want to ask you one more question before we move on to B, and that is about the order of addition. So you see that in the second step, I added the methyl iodide, and in the fourth step, I added the ethyl iodide. Does it matter which order I add these electrophiles? And could I have done the ethyl iodide first? Okay, Kyer says no, Andrew and Sabrina both say no, and they're all absolutely correct. It doesn't matter. So if you had added the ethyl iodide first, that's that's hunky-dory. There's no problem there whatsoever. And then you could add methyl iodide. Um, so second. So let's write here. I'll just write order, order, not um, important. Okay. So the textbook might be differ, different than what I put. But uh, either way, all roads lead to Rome, right? Okay. So let's try another one here. Let's try D. This is an interesting molecule here. This is called benzyl bromide. Benzyl bromide, you don't have to know the name of that right now, but benzyl bromide is an extremely powerful lacrimator, meaning that if you spill a drop of it, everybody in the lab will be crying. It has the, basically the effect of cutting onions, but greatly exacerbated. <laughs> Anyhow, so benzyl bromide. Anyhow, benzyl bromide is also a very, very snazzy electrophile, right? Because there's a dipole. Right, there's a dipole between um, the bromine and the carbon, which renders that carbon electrophilic. Okay, so I'm going to put a delta plus over here. Again, I'm sure the solutions manual doesn't go into all this detail, but again, we're kind of getting used to things here. Let's take a look at the number of carbons, and you can see that benzyl bromide has a total of seven carbons, but our final product has a total of seven, eight, nine carbons. And so we have to add two carbons and you notice that the two carbons that are added are look like they came from what molecule they look like they came from acetylene to me okay so there's a number of ways that i would say is correct to solve this problem you could either say i'm going to take benzyl bromide and i'm going to treat it with acetylide like if you really just did this if you just did this nothing else if you said i'm going to treat it with sodium acetylide and that, that's a commercially available reagent you can buy it as a solution in a bottle, so this is sodium acetylide. I won't write the name in. If you just wrote that, I'd give you 100%. Perfect. That's absolutely perfect, right? Because that sodium acetylide is going to act as a nucleophile, right? And it's going to displace the bromine like that, okay? And you're going to end up with the final product, okay? Now, if you want it to be even more detailed, and I know that some of my students just love details, and that, that's absolutely cool. If you said, well, I'm going to start with acetylene okay then i'm going to treat it with sodium amide okay so that i'll end up with sodium acetylene i can't buy it i can't afford it okay it's too expensive but i do have some acetylene gas from an old you know welding project that I was working on or something that's totally 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 acceptable okay so if you did that and then you said i'm going to treat that with benzyl bromide i'll just write the structure in here like that can draw our curved arrows again it's not asking us to draw the curved arrows it just can't help it and then we would end up with what we'd end up with this beautiful molecule that we were looking for all right a really interesting molecule and there you have it give me a thumbs up if you follow me on those ones and if you have a question feel free to shoot 
free to ask me anything. All right, I got a couple of thumbs up. I'll take it. I'll take it. Great. Excellent. Well, let's move on. And I'm going to kind of go over the whole, you know, there's a whole spiel that he gives you in here about how to approach a synthesis problem. I mean, I would always ask myself if there's a, if there's a change in the carbon skeleton. The good thing about organic chemistry at the undergraduate level is usually, usually it's abundantly clear if there's a change or not. Um, also, ask yourself, is there a change in functional group, right? So in order to solve a synthesis problem, you have to be able to recall, what does it say down here? This is really strong wording, isn't it? Anyhow, um, strong wording, but you have to be able to recall all of the reactions. You know, you really do. And you have to work through many examples. I know I'm repeating myself, but that always bear, uh, bears repeating. Anyhow, so if you had a problem like this, you can see how we're going from a molecule that has what how many carbons we've got one two three four five we've got five carbons here then we have one two we have seven carbons here so we have to add two carbons to the skeleton and your thought process or my thought process and what should be your thought process here is well hey i've got an acidic proton here right not acidic compared to sulfuric acid but in terms of carbon hydrogen bonds who can tell me what the pka of this hydrogen is did anybody tell me what the pka of that hydrogen is Something that we looked at. KA yeah, yeah, is equal to. We would have gone over this in detail. Yes, it's 25. Thanks, David. Yeah, but PK is 25. Okay. Exactly, Diego. Great. Perfect, you guys. Excellent. So you can deprotonate that, right? And produce a powerful electrophile, right? What would you have to do? And you're like, Mr. Dion, didn't you just do this 10 seconds ago? Yeah, I did. Okay. You treat it with sodium amide. And then you'd end up with this molecule, this anion, right? And that's going to be a powerful electrophile, or sorry, a powerful nucleophile. Then, of course, since you're only adding two carbons, you could use ethyl iodide. And then you have to reduce that triple bond. So I'm going to ask you one question about the reduction. And uh, where is it here? Oh, it's already, a, oh, I revealed the answer. Well, what I wanted to make sure is that you know how to reduce an alkyne, right? You see this beautiful alkyne right here. I want to make sure that you know how to reduce an alkyne to produce what? A trans, a trans alkene. It's already written here, isn't it? And that is to use sodium and liquid ammonia. My mnemonic for remembering this is I always think of sodium as, right? Sodium and liquid ammonia, right? And it kind of looks like you have, right? It kind of looks like it's trans. Anyhow, that's kind of how this guy remembers it. Anyhow, things my students have taught me along the way, all kinds of fun stuff. So let's let's get into some problems here where we have to grow some carbon skeletons here. These ones are a little, I'd say, higher in terms of their level of complexity compared to the problems that we just looked at. But let's start with 11.7, the first one. We're going from a molecule that has five carbons, and we're making a molecule that has eight carbons. Now you can see here, if you number these carbons, we have one, two, three, four, five, like this. Look if you number the molecule, the product, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, looky, looky, this is kind of interesting. That the fifth carbon here, the one that we know we can do something with, right? The one we know we can deprotonate, that happens to be this one here. And you can see that that has been reduced to a cis double bond and that you added what? One, two, three carbons to the molecule. And so the first thing that we're going to want to do with this, and I'm just going to walk you through it here a little bit faster, is that the first thing we're going to do is we're going to treat that with sodium amide. And when we treat that with sodium amide, just like we saw in the other examples, we are going to end up with, this is called an alkanide, okay? So when it's acetylene and you deprotonate it, you get an acetylide. When it's just a, a terminal alkyne and you deprotonate it, it's called an alkanide. So you get this alkanide. Who could tell me, what would I use as an electrophile in this case? Who can give me an idea of what would make a good electrophile if I want to add three carbons? It's not a trick question. This guy doesn't like trick questions. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It would be propyl iodide. Exactly. Winona says the same thing. Just gave me the molecular formula, perfectly acceptable. So I'm going to add propyl iodide. So I have one, two, three, and I'll put an iodine like that. And there you have it, folks. You'll do yourself a beautiful 
SN2 reaction like that, and you'll end up with this molecule. Now, let me try not to mess it up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And now I want to reduce this. I'm just going to write my reaction arrow a little bit strange. Okay. I'm going to write it like this. Can anybody tell me what the conditions are to reduce an alkyne to a cis alkene? Absolutely. Yes. Hydrogen, hydrogen and Lynn Myers catalyst. Exactly. Liam, thank you. David, perfect. John, great. Excellent. Andrew, poison catalyst, same thing. Yep, absolutely. So we'll put here hydrogen and Lindlar's Lynn Lynn catalyst. Okay. Lindlar's catalyst is just a poison, poison catalyst. Either way, works perfectly well. They both mean the exact same thing. Try the next one. Give it the old college try. Do it for, um, do it for Clyde. Okay, this one is kind of an interesting one. I'll kind of show you my solution for this one. <clears throat> um, guys, what we're doing here, <clears throat> excuse me, is we're adding how many carbons to the skeleton here, right? We have. You know, we got one, two, three, four here, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're adding three carbons, right? So we're adding these three carbons they need to be added to the molecule, okay? But the double bond, right, is over here in this position, which would be here, and there's no double bond there in that position. So that tells you you're going to get rid of that double bond from the get-go, okay? Another thing is that sometimes in the, when you're dealing with alkynes is that you can make assumptions that you have small um, uh, acetylide derivatives or small alkynide derivatives. So in this problem, in order to add those three carbons on the end, since the double bond is here, we're going to assume that we have this little molecule, okay? So we're going to assume that we have this as a nucleophile because that's got three carbons. So that would be, pro, would be propanide what it's called. And yeah, so we're going to make the assumption that we have that molecule, or sorry, that anion at our disposal. We bought it from a chemical supplier, okay? And so what we're going to have to do then is we're going to have to take our starting material and convert it into a good electrophile. And the way that we would do that is we would put a, a good leaving group at this position. Now, the easiest way to do that is to simply add bromine at that position. If I want to add bromine, and I'll highlight it in green here, if I want to add bromine at this position that I have highlighted in green, I want to put a bromine atom there, okay, and add hydrogen to this carbon here, okay, would that be a Markovnikov or an anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr? Exactly, it's an anti-Markovnikov addition. And so, thank you, perfect. So the Conditions that we use for anti-Markovnikov addition across a double bond are HBr and peroxides. And that would get us this interesting molecule right here. Okay, It would give us this guy right here. And now you can see we've got everything set up so that we can add our electrophile. Okay, So let's try that. Let's write that down across our reaction arrow. And we'll add or we'll draw it in here. Here's our nucleophile, and let's try practicing our SN2 curved arrows here, nucleophilic tack of the carbon, lots of leaving groups, and then we're going to end up with this molecule, and this is going to kind of show you where I was going here, so one, two, three, one, two. and there we have it, okay, and so the last step is simply going to be reduction to a trans alkene from an internal alkyne, and we already looked at that. And to do that, we use sodium and liquid ammonia like that. Okay, I'm gonna skip the next one for now and get into some other problems. Again, you have the solution to this one. This is one of the problems from 11.7. And let's talk about retrosynthetic analysis just for a little bit. Retrosynthetic analysis, I'm not, an ex I'm not a historian, um, uh, in terms of retrosynthetic analysis, but I believe it was mostly developed by E.J. Corey um, at Harvard University, so Elias Corey, who won the Nobel Prize in organic chemistry at least once. Anyhow, 
And basically what he did is if he wanted to make a molecule that was really um, complicated, yes, in quizzes you can assume you have those assembly derivatives, yes. Um, what he would do is if he wanted to synthesize a really big molecule, um, uh, history kind of, I guess the urban legend, and I don't think it's an urban legend, I think it's true, but what he would do is he would write the structure of the molecule, a big molecule, um, on a chalkboard in his office, and he would leave it up there for at least a year before he would start the synthesis. You're like, well, why would he do that, you know? The reason why is because he would look at that all the time. Now, not, that's not all he would do over the course of a year, but he would see it every day, and he would think backwards, right? He would look at the functional groups, and he'd take a step back, okay, and say, well, I could make that functional group from this functional group. That's what retrosynthetic analysis is, and it's really handy. And I can tell you right now, if you're like, oh, I didn't even need it in organic chemistry one, it's going to become even a better tool for you in organic chemistry too. So we begin by solving the last step in the synthesis first. All right. And you can read all the, the chicken scratch that's on here, okay? But it says here, perform a retrosynthetic analysis for the following synthesis. We want to take this alcohol and um, we want to convert it into an alkyne. Well, what I would say is there's not that many ways that we know how to make an alkyne except for from a geminal or a vicinal dihalide, right? That's something that we actually talked about last class. Okay, so we're actually focusing on that very last step. And here you have it, folks. Here are the geminal or vicinal dihalides. There's three of them that you could all use. And what would you do? You'd treat all of them with what? And I'm kind of going a little faster here, but you treat these first with excess sodium amide, right? Step one is excess sodium amide. Uh, I can't write fast, but yeah, step two is going to be treated with water, right? If you treated all three of these with excess sodium amide in water, you'd always end up with this molecule. The problem is the only one of these that we know how to make is the vicinal dihalide, right? These two are geminal. Geminal means Gemini, right? Twins, the two bromines on the same carbon. But we do know how to make this or make this molecule from the vicinal dibromide. Okay, we know how to do that. So then the question becomes, well, how the heck do you make a vicinal dibromide? The only way we know how to do that is from an alkene, right, and treating it with bromine. So you see what we're doing here is we're just going backwards. And we already solved um, the last step. And then you can go backwards again and say, well, the only way that I know how to make this is from an alkene and by treating it with bromine. You see what I'm saying? This is where it would be really helpful for me to be able to see your faces, see if you're like, yes or no. <laughs> okay, but anyhow. This is the alkene, and then we would simply treat that with bromine. So then, the see, we're just doing the whole problem backwards. Now the last step is, what are we doing here? Is we're taking that alcohol, and we want to make an alkene. So that's an elimination, but an alcohol isn't a good leaving group. And so what would we do to do that? First, we convert it into a good leaving group, like a tosylate, using tosyl chloride and pyridine. And then finally, we treat it with a strong base that is a weak nucleophile, which will give us the E2 reaction with a primary leaving group, okay? If you were to use something like sodium, so you, if you might be thinking like, why in this step, why right here, why did you not use sodium methoxide? I thought we always like to use that or T-butoxide. The problem with those is that, is that those are strong nucleophiles. And so you would get some SN2. And if you're a little bit unsure about, you know, the DBU, DBN thing, it might be wise for you to look at figure so figure 7.20, it's one of the figures in the book that has the whole um, analysis of, you know, strong base, weak nucleophile, strong base, strong nucleophile, et cetera, and then primary, secondary, and tertiary um, leaving group. So that might be wise for you to review those concepts. Anyhow, I've talked enough about synthesis or retrosynthesis. There's all the steps. Wow, five steps. That's a lot. If you think about it, you look at modern syntheses today, and some of them have, you know, 60 steps, okay? They also have an army of scientists working on them, but anyhow, let's give this one uh, the old college try here. Let me find my notes. It says here, 11.9, propose an efficient synthesis for each of the following transformations. Now, I'm sure that some of you are just like <clears throat> gung-ho to start adding two carbons to this acetylene and 
you're doing um, a halo hydrin formation and that's cool that's perfectly cool nothing wrong with that whatsoever but i would be remiss if i didn't talk about retrosynthesis a little bit and so let's look at this product here okay so this is what we call a halo hydrin it has a bromine and a hydroxyl and how would we make a halo hydrin? We only know one way to make that molecule. We've lear literally learned one way to make that, and that would be from this molecule. If we had one butene, okay, we would treat that with bromine, right, with bromine and H2O, okay, and that would give us the halo hydrin. That is the final product. So this, what I'm, and if you're like, what are you doing, Mr. Dion? I'm doing retrosynthesis, okay? Just thinking about the problem backwards. And so the, now the question becomes, you know, how would I get from acetylene to one butene? Okay, now, now I think the problem is a little bit more, you know, maybe a little bit more realistic, or maybe a, a, a more simplified, I should say. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to employ the exact same reactions that we have so far to um, um, add more carbons to our skeleton because we have two carbons here and we have four carbons here. And so first we're gonna treat that with sodium amide. And I'm, again, I'm writing out all the steps in detail here. And you don't have to do this every time you're practicing if you are confident in what you're doing. And then in the next step, we're gonna add ethyl iodide because we need to add two carbons to our skeleton. And that would give us this molecule. So this molecule is called one butyne. Okay, now we need to be able to convert one butyne into, into one butene. And we've looked at that already. Now, there are two choices, okay? Since this is a terminal alkene made from a terminal alkyne, it doesn't matter if you use um, hydrogen, hydrogen and Lindlar's catalyst or if you want to use sodium metal reduction. Either way, you're going to get the same answer because it's not cis or trans, okay? I, in the textbook, I think, always choose hydrogen and Lindlar's catalyst. And the reason why is because hydrogen is much easier to use. It's a very fast reaction to set up very easily. You just easy. You just need a party balloon. I'm not kidding. Some hydrogen, a little bit of catalyst, throw it in there, stir it, go have a smoke, but not near the balloon come back and it's all done, okay? So that's a really nice reaction. Whereas messing around with sodium, I've probably told you, you probably realized that I have a little bit of a fear of messing around with sodium. Um, bad memories of messing around with it too much in graduate school. Anyhow, so now we have our um, one butene. And then finally, in the last step, we're just gonna treat that with bromine and water. And we're gonna end up with our halo hydrin. And, you know, just you know, kind of put this bug in your ear. This might be a reaction that you might want to look at the mechanism. I'm not going to ask you the mechanism on the next quiz. But, you know, that might be a good challenge for yourself is, you know, how much do I remember from last semester? Could you draw the mechanism of this, of this reaction? I'm not going to do it right now, but um, could you draw that mechanism? And, and do you understand why the hydroxyl ends up with the more substitute, substituted carbon? Now, I taught this class last spring to a lot of you, and I taught it to, to some of you this summer. And I know that I went over that the whole rationale behind that in some detail. So that's something that you should know. Let's take a look at the next one. The next one is one of my favorites because we start with an alkane, okay? Now, I know I said I was gonna give you the whole uh, spiel about uh, retrosynthesis, and here I am breaking my rule right away. But if we're starting with Come on, you guys, get real. If we're starting with this alkane, so this is 2,3-dimethylbutane, what's the only possibility we have for our first reaction? Who could tell me? We've literally got one thing we can use. Exactly. So David says, you know, halogenation with bromine, right? Because bromine is more selective than chlorination. <laughs> Okay, now Sean's being sarcastic, and he says burn it. So, look, Sean, you got to know combustion reactions absolutely, and I, I know you're just teasing me, but um, you could you could uh, um, burn the molecule absolutely, but that's never going to be the answer in this class. Okay, somebody says sunburn, keepers, you guys. Okay, 
Well, I'm glad to see you haven't lost your sense of humor, despite the situation that we're all in right now in this country. Okay, so first we're going to treat it with bromine, uh, BR2, in light. We're going to draw a line here just so I don't get confused. And what we're going to end up with is this molecule. There we go. Okay, so that's our first step. The, the, the reason I brought that up first is I just want you to be aware that when you have an alkane, you've literally got one choice, okay? And that is to do a bromination, okay? Let's get back to the retrosynthesis thing here for just a second, Roo, here. And um, it's kind of tough for me to ask some questions online, but I'm going to give it the old college try here. Could anybody tell me, like, this molecule, just thinking retrosynthetically, what... What would be the last step? Does anybody have an idea? I bet you my students have some great ideas. What functional group would I need in the molecule that I'm looking for, the, the second to last molecule, if I think about this in terms of retrosynthesis? Yeah, so somebody says, uh, somebody says acid. Yeah, so H3O plus. Well, we're definitely, we're definitely adding water to the molecule. Right for sh for sure. There's there's going to be some addition of water. There's no Lily and Skylar, you're both correct. There's there's going to be some addition of water. There's no doubt about it, right? But then Winona is like throwing in here sodium hydroxide and and uh, and hydrogen peroxide, right? And then so you're all on in the right in the right place, right? Because you're understanding that we're adding water to the molecule some damn way, right? That's number one. But what, what, what Winona is saying is that it's going to be an anti Markovnikov addition, right? So let's think about it this way, and I'll kind of help you out here. If you had this alkene, right? If we had this alkene right here, exactly, yes. If we had this alkene, what if we treated it with TH3 and THF, so boring and THF, and then the second step, if we treated it with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide, that would give me an anti-Markovnikov addition of water across that alkene, which would give me the desired product. Excuse me. And so now the question simply becomes, I, sh I, I, don't, I should never say simply, but now the question becomes, you know, how do, we, how do I get from here to here? All right, how do I get from that bromine um, or that, that um, uh, alkyl bromide to this alkene, and, I, and I'm sure many of you have the answer already, okay? But I'm going to go through it a little bit slowly. And look, in order to do an elimination reaction, you have to have a beta proton. Now, there are two types of beta protons in this molecule. There's these ones here, and then there's also this one here. The problem with the one in red is if I remove that, I would put the double bond here, okay? I would not have that terminal double bond. I'd have an internal double bond. Okay, and so the way that I remove the blue proton is, as Andrew suggested, is that I'm going to use a hindered base, potassium t-butoxide. So he wrote potassium t-butoxide. Potassium t-butoxide is a big old base. In fact, we could even draw, why don't we just delete that? We'll just draw the Lewis structure, okay? So it doesn't look that big the way I drawn it, maybe. But it is a big hindered base. I'll even throw in the cation. We're even getting into spectator ions now. We're really getting down and dirty with it here. But we're going to abstract that proton, right? We're going to lose the bromine like this, and we're going to form the double bond where we want it. So we're doing a regioselective elimination, and we're going to end up with the desired alkene. And then, of course, in the last step, we're going to use boring and THF followed by... Uh, Hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Give me the old I love UCCS. Let me unmute my mic, sing the university's theme. Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> thumbs up. Good. Great. Okay. Again, um, do we risk a double bromination when we apply bromine and light? No, we don't risk a double bromination. And normally what you would do is you would run that reaction in a solvent, okay? And our textbook loves to leave out solvents, but you would never treat the molecule with just 
pure bromine, which we call we would call that neat bromine. That would be really nasty. You would probably run it in a solvent like um, chloroform, CHCl3. And so you would only add one mole of the bromine. And remember, bromination, um, the first step is an endothermic reaction. And so, which I went over in detail in chapter 10 with you guys. And so, no, you will not get polybromination. All right, let's move on. Um, you want me to do the next one? Let, let me do it for you. I'll show you kind of my quick answer. This one I'm not going to go over in gross and dirty detail because I'm running out of space and we're going to try some other problems. But I'll show you very quickly how I would solve this problem. Okay. Look, the only thing you can do with this starting material, which is 2-methylbutane, is first of all is going to be to brominate it. So we're going to treat it with bromine and electromagnetic radiation, and we're going to end up with this molecule, 2-bromo-2-methylbutane. Then we're trying to get a triple bond on the other side of the molecule. And so I have the option of either pulling off this beta proton or this beta proton in red. But if I pull off the beta proton, in red, that's going to get me closer to having it um, unsaturation to the position that I want it in. And so I'm going to treat this with sodium ethoxide, NaOET, okay? And then that's going to remove the less hindered proton. And I'm going to do an elimination and I'm going to end up with this alkene, okay? Like that. Now I need to move that alkene over one more position. And so I'm going to start by doing an anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. So I'm going to use HBr and peroxides. That's going to give me this molecule. I can treat that with a hindered base like T-butoxide, potassium T-butoxide, and I'm going to end up with this molecule. Okay. And then I'm going to treat that with bromine. Oh boy, I'm running out of space here. Let me, let me see here. I've become like a Jedi with my which McCollum iPad. There we go. So we're going to treat that with bromine. We're going to make a vicinal dibromide like this. And then to get to the final product, we're going to treat it with one excess sodium amide. Right? We do a double deprotonation. And then we deprotonate the terminal. Um, alkyne that's formed and we quench it with water. Okay, I kind of went over that one a little bit quickly, but that's basically how you solve that one there. And I wanted to move over to, hey, let me just tell you this. I'm going to give you a little tidbit. Dr. Anderson is the chair of, um, is there a reason why the textbook typically uses sodium methoxide in sodium, instead of sodium ethoxide? I don't know. Maybe he's hooked on it. I don't know. There, there's no there's no reason that I can think of. You know what, Sean? I would love to come up with and give you some reason that's, you know, above the scope, beyond the scope of this course, like maybe one is more soluble than another, right? You guys, have you guys ever thought about, now I'm really going off on a rabbit trail here. Have you ever thought about why OET is a sodium salt, right? Whereas O-T-butyl is a potassium salt, right? There's reasons for that, okay? And that's not even what you asked me, so I'll delete that. But um, I, I can't think of a good reason, Sean. I cannot think of a good reason. So anyhow, I digress. What I was saying is, if you want a little bit of a, you know, kind of Mr. Dion's wink, wink, inside tip, on the ACS final, even though we skipped the green chemistry portion, I, I went over it kind of quickly this summer with my students. I would, I would recommend reading it, just giving it a quick perusal, because... Green chemistry, as you can imagine, in 2020, I mean, now everybody's kind of forgotten about the environment because we're throwing masks and gloves and wipes uh, down the drain like everything. But once once we get a vaccine, we'll get back on the environment bandwagon. And, um, you know, chemists are always looking for a good way to reduce waste nowadays. It's a really hot area of research. Um, if you want to get grant money, it's a great way to, to get, I, I think, to get grant money would be to take this on as an area of interest in your research, or if you're a researcher. And so what, and if you're like, Mr. Dion, you're rambling, what's your point? My point is, my point is um, that um, 
these standardized exams, they always like to ask maybe one question about green chemistry, okay? You know, which one of these is the most effective in terms of reducing waste? So it might be wise to take a look at that, but you can clearly see that these two reactions do the exact same thing, whether you use oxymercuration, uh, demercuration, or acid-catalyzed hydration, but you can see that all these waste atoms when you use oxymercuration, right? All these waste atoms that go down the drain versus, I mean, come on, if you're just doing acid-catalyzed hydration, just a little bit of acid and water, and boom, um, you're not polluting the environment nearly as much. So something to think about, and you can read about that in your own spare time, but I'm not going to ask you about that in your quiz, so I bet you don't care now. And... I'll just mention this before we try some more problems. Um, this is one here. It says multiple correct answers. You're going to see this even more in Chemistry 3111 that you might be practicing with a friend over Microsoft Teams or Zoom or something. And you'll both come up with an answer that are very different, but are both perfectly legitimate answers. Now, the, and if you're like, oh, good, I can do anything. Nah. The caveat I would add to this is that Say, for example, and I've seen this happen several times on paper quizzes, is say I ask my students a synthesis problem, okay? One person solved the problem in, you know, four steps, and if another person took 11 steps to do it, well, I'm not going to give any credit for somebody that took 11 steps to do something that should have been done in four steps, because that is not efficient, and that's also not green chemistry, right? That's being very wasteful. All right, anyhow. It says at the bottom, in general, a chemist's goal is to find the most facile synthesis, generally having the fewest steps. There's all kinds of beautiful, elegant syntheses out there that people have won prizes for, simply because, you know, they're just very elegant in terms of reducing waste and things like that. All right. And there you have it. That's everything. Let's call it a day. No, I'm kidding. I can't do that. So I thought we would try some practice problems. And just kind of take it a little bit slower now. I have a habit of speaking quickly sometimes. So I wanted to try a few problems and just kind of go over these in detail. Um, and let's start with this, this problem here. So we're going to take this molecule. So one bromobutane. And I want to know if you guys could find a way to make this really cool molecule. This molecule, and we can draw it on my lone pair. Is really getting down to basics here with the old Lewis structures, right? Anyhow, I'll let you think about this for a second. Okay, does anybody have an idea about this problem? Anything they want to share with the class? Just any thoughts they have with the problem at all, I'll take it. And we don't, yeah, I, I like the way you think. Yeah, Andrew says we added a carbon. Yeah, we actually added two carbons to the molecule, right? If you look at the molecule on the on the left, we have one, two, three, four carbons over here. We have one, two. Am I missing a carbon? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, Mr. Dion drew the structure incorrect. Bad, bad boy. There we go. So are you guys? There we go. That's better. Okay, so now we have. But either way, Andrew, you're in the definitely. I had the right answer, five, six. Okay, now that probably makes it a little bit simpler. So we added two carbons. Look, let's go through this slowly. What have we got here? We've got an alkyl halide, right? We have a good electrophile, right? And if you're wondering what the heck's an electrophile, it's a species that's seeking electrons, right? Because we have a dipole between the carbon and the bromine, which renders this carbon here electrophilic. And so it's ready to be attacked by a nucleophile. Now, if I want to add two carbons to the molecule, what's the classic nucleophile that we've used, you know, virtually every time? It's been sodium acetylide. And so if we were to treat that with sodium acetylide, we would end up adding two carbons to the molecule. Let's draw the curved arrows. Just an SN2 reaction. 
nucleophilic attack, followed by loss of leaving group, and we would end up with one, two, three, four, five, oops, that's not right, five, six. So we'd end up with this molecule. Okay, are you ready? Oh, Sean, you answered my question. While I had my head down and wasn't looking at the chat, I was thinking up a nice tasty question and you answered it, okay? So my question was this. My question was gonna be, can anybody identify this functional group, okay? I know that you're all aware of what an ether is. So if you have an R group and then an oxygen and then an R group, that's an ether, okay? But if you have an oxygen in some kind of ring, okay? Put here um, n, where n is equal to one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. That's called an epoxide. Epoxide. Okay. Anyhow, so we have an epoxide. We want to make an epoxide. Does it? Can anybody help me out with the epoxide synthesis? How do you make an epoxide? Sometimes like students get stumped on this one. Somebody says bromine. Somebody says MCPBA to an alkene. So, so what Andrew is saying um, is he's saying you would add MCPBA to an alkene, right? So he's thinking retrosynthetically. I like it. So he's saying if you were to take this compound and just think retrosynthetically, what Andrew Bach is saying is he's saying if I had one, two, three, four, um, five, six, he said if I had that alkene, so that would be one hexene. If I had that, I could simply treat that with MCPBA, metachloro per benzoic acid, and that would produce an epoxide. Now, you might just be thinking, well, hey, MCPBA, didn't we use that to make a transdial? Yes, we did. But remember, that's a two-step process, okay? I'll even help you out here. Let's draw it down here. Now, I'm really switching gears just for a second, but if we were to take the cyclohexene and treat it with MCPBA in the first step. And in the second step, we treat it with a catalytic amount of acid. Then you end up with a transdiol. Okay. So it proceeds. Yeah. You end up with a transdiol like that, but we're not doing that in this problem. We're simply making the epoxide because in the first step, okay, the first step, what happens is you make an epoxide. And if you're like, oh, I don't remember that. Well, I went over it. There you go. Like that. So in the first step, you make an epoxide. And in the second step, you blow that open with the acid. Okay, so now we're kind of getting down to the down to the end here. And the question becomes, how do we get from this terminal alkyne to a terminal alkene? Well, everybody knows that. You've either got the choice of using hydrogen and Lindlar's catalyst, which I'm going to use. Or if you want to put in here sodium metal reduction, that works perfectly well. And so the first step is treatment with sodium acetylide. The second step is hydrogenation with Lindmeier's catalyst. And the last step is to simply treat that with MCPBA. I should, I gotta stop saying simply. I'm trying to sound smart. Okay. Just remember, there's nothing simple in organic chemistry. Okay. If it was simple, they could, anybody on the street could do it. Okay, and not anybody on the street can do okay. So I should be careful what I say. All right. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Or ask me a question if you have a question. Cha cha cha. Okay, I got a few thumbs ups. All right. Don't be afraid to ask a question. Remember. Something I've learned being a teacher is that if one student has a question, there's a good chance that somebody else has that same question. Okay, so if I'm unclear about something, you stop me. We've got time right now. And later on, the class will be moving a little bit faster than this when we get into, you know, some new stuff. A good scientist should never use the word stuff. The thing, but uh, let's see here. Let's start with this geminal dibromide. And can we make we make a ketone? Could you make a ketone from a geminal dibromide? I'll let you think about this just for a second. When did we cover MCPBA? 
So that would have been in chapter eight. Okay. So Lily, look at the section about dihydroxylation. So sin dihyd or anti dihydroxylation. Yes. So Caitlin says it's section eight point one zero. All right. There we go. So eraser. All right. Lily, you got any ideas on this one? Or anybody? Shouldn't put students on the spot. I'll take any ideas in chat. We're all okay. Except for burn it. I won't accept that one. All right, Liam has a good idea. He says excess sodium hydride. I think that's a good idea. Look. Let's stop just for a second. Take a deep breath. Come on, put yourself in in the quiz room, right? You're writing the quiz. You're looking at this molecule. That is a geminal dibromide. We haven't learned. I, I know it's. I know when you're learning the subject, organic chemistry can feel overwhelming, and you're like, I've so many reactions. But you know what Patrick Swayze said? It's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay, we literally know one sinking thing that we can do with a geminal dibromide and that is to make an alkyne from it we literally have nothing else under our hat okay so sometimes you can even look at the starting material and be like i don't know what to do okay i'm i'm pretty unsure but i know that when i have a geminal dibromide i can literally do one thing and that would be to treat it with excess sodium amide followed by water, and then I would get this molecule. I'm going to draw it, and then I'm going to figure out what the hell I'm going to do with it, okay? There you go. That's it. And what David is saying is he's saying the next step would be to basically affect a, um, a hydration reaction, a Markovnikov hydration, using sulfuric acid and water and mercuric sulfate to make a methyl ketone, right? That's one of the reactions that we looked at on Wednesday in question 11.2. And what the reason you have to use mercuric sulfate, you might be wondering like, why can't you just use acid and water, good old Markovnikov? The reason why is because alkynes are not very reactive or they're not as reactive as alkenes because you would end up with a vinylic carbocation, which, are, which is highly unstable. And so you have to have HDSO4, and you're like back to Gen Chem 1. That's mercury two sulfate or mercuric sulfate. Either one is fine. And what you do is simply, this is, we can write it in here. This is Markovnikov addition, Markovnikov addition of H2O. Now let's draw what you would get after a Markovnikov addition. The rich are going to get richer. And so we would end up with this, where we'd have the hydrogen on the end and we'd have the hydroxyl here. Does anybody recognize this player? What this guy's called? Absolutely. This is an enol, right? Because why? Because it's awesome. Because it's got an alkene and an alcohol in the same molecule. Okay. And when you have an enol where the double bond is on the end like that, that's going to undergo a process called tautomerization. Okay. So it tautomerize. Okay. So tautomerization to produce a methyl ketone. And there you have it, folks. So that is all. It is a three-step process to make this methyl ketone. And if you're like, why is it called a methyl ketone? Why? Because this is a methyl group. So this is called a methyl to methyl ketone. Now, if you're a real biology hound and you're like, hey, isn't that an acetyl group, like acetyl found in acetyl coenzyme A? Yes, it is in a way. But um, we'll call it a methyl ketone here. All righty. I don't think I had enough breakfast. Is anybody else hungry? Like that's got nothing to do with chemistry. So, all right. I got, okay, very hungry people. Okay, good. I'm starving. And I have class right after this. Little fix. All right, let's try another one. Okay. This summer, I was teaching an online class, and 
there was a discussion component, you know, where the students had discussions online. And there was one where they had to write about, you know, chemistry of food or something like that. And one of the guys was always just, ugh, his discussions were just, anyway, they were interesting. And he would write some stuff in there that I'd be like, what? Because one of them he wrote, is, because it says, oh, in order to get a, to, to get to maximize your grade, you have to respond to other students' posts, you know, in this discussion. And some, uh, one of the girls in the class wrote something all about um, how lemon meringue and how lemon uh, interacts with copper in a copper bowl to make this big meringue and whatever. And anyhow, his, all his reply was, this post makes me hungry for knowledge. <laughs> cornball anyhow let's move on you're like that was a big lead up to not a very funny story okay anyhow so we're going to take this molecule two three uh dimethyl butane come on people what's our only option here we're starting out with an alkane absolutely just to treat it with bromine and Light, nothing else. Thank you guys, that's perfect. So we're gonna end up brominating, and we're gonna end up with this molecule. Ah, uh, little sticks. Anyhow, it's not the prettiest drawing, but you get the idea. Does anybody have an idea where we're going here? Right, you look at this molecule, it's got six carbons, and then this one only has three carbons. Does anybody know what the key step is in this synthesis? Or have an idea where the heck we're going we're go yeah exactly exactly so a bunch of my students have just replied ozonolysis and they're absolutely right okay so what you need to do here and i'll just kind of go over this one a little bit quicker is that you need to remove this beta proton which is a hindered proton okay and so to do that we're going to use a uh, unhindered base like sodium ethoxide And then we're going to end up with this molecule. So this is 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene. Okay, and then you're simply going to slice that open. So let me, in fact, let me erase it. And if you've forgotten, there was an excellent skill builder in our book where he said you take your alkene, right, like this, and you're going to treat it with ozone. And then in the second step, you're going to treat it with DMS. And he said when you're trying to figure out what the products are, you take your alkene, I'm going to copy this, copy, copy, paste, paste, there we go. Okay, you take that, and what you do is you erase the middle like this, and then you just draw oxygens on the end. And you can see that what we have here is this molecule. I didn't circle the whole thing, but anyhow, you end up with this three-carbon ketone. And you should know what that molecule is called. Does anybody know the common name of this molecule? And you're like, oh, come on. We haven't even done a chapter on, on ketones yet. Yeah, it's acetone. And you're like, why should I know that? Because acetone is widely used in the lab for washing glassware. It's also used as a solvent in chemistry, too. But anyhow, there you have it is acetone. Nail polish remover, that's right. It can also give you brain cancer. So, yeah, don't, don't mess around with the acetone too much. All right. So I am going to open this up and I am going to stop presenting. Okay. I go to application. So now you can see my face, even if you don't want to. And I'll just ask you guys, we have five minutes left. I don't want to take extra time. I don't like doing that. I did that yesterday, I think. I might have made class go on a little bit too long. So I'll just ask you, are there any questions? Again, I will post an announcement about the quiz, and I'm going to try to always post the recordings of these lectures so that you can watch them, you know, more than once, should you wish to do so. Um, this summer, I even had a student who uh, sent me an email and said that they watched a lecture three times, you know, and the student said, well, at the end, I just kind of knew it, you know, I couldn't help it. So, yeah, maybe what, or like we talked about last class, watching the videos a couple times can't hurt. Um, yeah. Any questions at all? Can we expect other quizzes to be multiple choice too? Yeah, that's a really good question, question, Ashley. So the answer right now is, yep, you really can. So you don't have to know the MCPBA mechanism 
we don't we don't do that mechanism in this class. So I will never ask that mechanism. I went over it quickly this summer, and it is in the textbook, so you can take a look at it. But it's not a required mechanism for this class. Um, so the thing. So let me tell you about the quizzes. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So first thing, quiz eleven is all multiple choice. Okay. No curved arrows to draw. Cool. Um, what else? Can we, and then Ashley said, can we expect the other quizzes to be multiple choice? Well, this summer, I tried a few things, like Dr. Anderson and I tried some experiments, and people like David and uh, Sabrina were here for my experiments, and Yvonne, they were in my class this summer. And, um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. yeah, so those people were in my class, and I tried a whole, holy host of things, and the best solution that we found was to use Respondus and to have just multiple choice quizzes. So that's what we're going to stick with, at least for quizzes 12, 13, and 16. Um, what else? So the, the quizzes that require respondents, I'll keep those open for the whole day. So I will have those open for at least a few hours, you know, multiple hours. Somebody said, how long does the quiz take normally, and do we go over it in class after? Um, the quizzes, again, the quizzes I think are usually timed for 75 minutes or 60 minutes or something like that. Um, and do we go over it in class? Um, usually no. Usually no, we don't go over the quizzes. I'll give you access to them once everybody's completed it so that you can see your answers, which ones you got right and which ones you got wrong, if you got any wrong at all. But um, yeah, there we go. So just like last semester, if you were with me in the spring, I would always, uh, will we have class on quiz day? Hey, that's a good question. The answer is no. So we won't be having a class on quiz day. I don't think that's, I shouldn't, I should be careful what I say because I'm recording this. But um, I'll say, Joe, I'm going to tread lightly on this one. For now, no. Quiz day, remember last spring, quiz day was quiz day. Okay. I used to give you a little lecture at the end. Um, I like one. Let me think about this. You know what, Joe? I'll tell you what. This is my first time teaching Organic 2 online. Verdict is out, okay? Verdict is not in yet. Would you guys be interested in doing some extra work on quiz day? If I have the quiz open the whole day anyway? Would anybody be cool with that? E and even if you weren't there, I would still record it. I'm looking at the chat to see if anybody has an answer. So, so I got Brianna. That is fine, okay. Yeah, I'd be cool with that. That would be cool. Okay. Yeah, it might help as long as the quiz is open all day. Yeah, yeah, Sophia, I'm not going to do you a, a, a bad one, you know, and just throw you to the wolves. No, if, if I had the quiz open all day, it might be, yeah, so like Caitlin said, it might be a good time for us to try some extra practice. Yeah, I, I could dig that. I could dig that. Um, let me talk to Dr. Anderson about it. Let's see what he's got an opinion, which he might have a strong one sometimes he does sometimes he's like do what you want so yeah yeah the cool thing is that even if you guys even if somebody had something else going on right i could record it it always uh yeah extra practice is always helpful couldn't have said it better myself extra review instead of new content um lily that would depend on the day i suppose but i'd probably get into new stuff because i'll be honest with you guys some of these chapters are really heavy you know they just are so it might be fun for us to actually have a little extra class time. In fact, in Gen Chem 1, we do have extra class time. So, All right. Anyhow, it's 914. That's, that's long enough. I'm going to sign off for now. And remember, the quiz will be open on Friday. And we're going to get together on Monday, um, August 31st. And we're going to talk about alcohols and phenols. Really fun chapter. Um, what made you decide to have quizzes on Fridays and not Mondays? The schedule. Okay. So the first two quizzes are on Fridays. After that, quiz 13, 16, 17 are on Mondays. Quiz 18 is on a Wednesday. Quiz Taylor, it doesn't matter. They're just on days. All right. Okay, see you later.